We acknowledge the ancient ones, the greater shamanic council of light, Hermes, both Trismegistus and Seshet, lady of the measuring cord, as above, so below, as within, so without. We acknowledge Imhotep, architect of the cosmos. May the earth be the mirror of heaven. We acknowledge the sacred order of the Magi and all throughout history who knew, like now, a turning of the ages. We acknowledge the master builders of Gobekli Tepe and the great shining ones at Kalamish. The courage and knowledge of the Polynesian wayfinders traversing the great oceans. We acknowledge the prophetic traditions of Ezekiel and Daniel, the traditions of Avalon, the Merlin, and the Round Table, the calendric wizardry of the Maya, and the Venus teachings from Mesoamerica, the Jupiter teachings originating in China, and the Vedic lunar mansion traditions, the Babylonian and Sumerian sidereal zodiacs, the brilliant Hellenistic invention of the seasonal zodiac. The Neolithic peoples around the planet, some still today, honoring the sacred connection between the land and the sky. The Tuatha de Danann in Ireland, who created a time of 2,000 years of peace, the builders of Newgrange. My teachers that are not in human form, Mount Shasta, the grandfather rock, at the wonderland of rocks in Joshua Tree, Mount Haleakala in Maui, the Fish Lake Valley, Herophany, and the sacred landscapes around the planet. The astrosophy of Rudolf Steiner and the esoteric astrology of DK and the Tibetan, both presaging the shamanic astrology paradigm, and particularly the archetypal visions of C.G. Jung and the cosmology of my mentor, Dane Rajar. For these and more, we give. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Daniel Jamario. This is our monthly full moon blogcast. This is the sixth one that we've had since this uh, presentation started. Um, now, with me today is Mary Kern, um, who is the president of the Shamanic Astrology Mystery School. Uh, she's helped me on a number of these in the last number of months. And all the way from Ireland, uh, checking in with us is Ashley Walsh, um, who's prepared the slides for today. And she's a member of the Shamanic Astrology Mystery School Outreach Team. And our subject today is something that has been of just tremendous interest to me um, ever since the late 60s and early 70s when I got started as an astrologer, sex and gender in the shamanic astrology paradigm. Um, a rich subject and also controversial. Um, a little background. As I was beginning my astrology practice and interest, it was right at the time period of the, the beginning of the more recent uh, um, movement of bringing the feminine up to par, up to par I guess we could say, the, the early feminist movement. It was also the time period of a lot of other cultural revolutions that were happening at that time. And I was part of a group of astrologers that wanted to expand beyond the culturally assigned roles of what a man is supposed to be, or what a woman was supposed to be. It was also the time period of the beginning of, of gay liberation that was happening at that particular time also. And as a foundational piece of the shamanic astrology paradigm, it had always been my tremendous interest to help people be their archetype, to be who they really are, as opposed to what their parents or what the culture they were born into um, uh, assigned to them. And uh, as this went through the 70s and the 80s, um, uh, it was pretty liberating. In, in fact, uh, as, a, as a foundational piece within this approach to astrology, which, which is in shamanic astrology, but in some of the other transpersonal and humanistic astrological pieces that were coming through at that time, it freed a lot of people to, to be beyond uh, what the culture said a man was supposed to be or what a woman was supposed to be. 
Uh, this worked really, really well. And, and as we got into the late 80s and early 90s, the, the, this, this foundation worked pretty well to, to be able to say there are many different archetypes of the feminine, many different archetypes of the masculine. Uh, in the last maybe five, 10 years, there's been a, a fair amount of confusion around this as things have moved in a different direction. And I think we need to um, kind of go into some foundational pieces here. What would be a starting point of even having a discussion around sex and gender and how the, can that be used in, in a, an astrological system? Um, both from some of my masculine te men teachers and women teachers, the, I think the, the right starting point is we're first and foremost human beings. We're homo sapien. Now that's a huge uh, issue itself. You know, like uh, even in the last 10 years, more and more other forms of uh, human species have been found in our own DNA but at least we are all human. And I like to agree that we're all homo sapiens, uh, organic beings who are actually 95% of human beings are fully binary. That, that is to say that they can either be XX or XY. And that corresponds very much with the animal kingdom where 95% of them animal species are, are, are binary, either male or female. Um, it turns out also that um, only about half of 1% of uh, babies born are completely hermaphrodite, meaning uh, they're equal amounts of XX and XY and therefore would end up having um, both sexual organs. Um, now, if we have our starting point that we're all human and that we're in some way binary, and that even goes back to an understanding of the I Ching uh, and also of the yin yang symbol, um, which is uh, fluid. You know, so you basically it's binary, but it flows together with each other. That uh, if we, we then say biologically, the definition of sex is whether we're XX or XY. Gender though, on the other hand, now this has really confused the issue. If you go into the history of the, of the use of this word, up until 1955, gender was only used for grammar. Now, now that's, a, that's a whole larger subject and I actually cover um, the problems associated with that in my Origins of the Shamanic Astrology book, where Romance languages would assign uh, masculine or gen or ma masculine or feminine or neutral words to to any noun. Um, actually, some cultures had it had it different than than um, uh, the way we normally assume it. You know, the sun is masculine and the moon is, is moon is feminine. Um, this is not an exhausted list, exhaustive list, but Norwegian, Lithuanian, German, Teutonic, Sanskrit, Swedish, ancient Anglo-Saxon, Sumerian, Arabic, Egyptian, Japanese, and many South American languages um, are the reverse. Moon, uh, masculine, and sun, feminine. Um, actually, the Norse word, suna, which became sun, in our current language, is the sun goddess. And the Anglo-Saxon word Mona, which became moon, is a masculine word for the moon god. Those words, of course, are the, are, are the originals in English for the sun and the moon. The thing, the thing is, the further back you go, there's gods and goddesses for both the sun and the moon. Um, actually, one of the things that I, I love discovering because I love Ireland so much is that in Ireland, in the Gaelic uh, language, actually in Ireland it's Gaelic, sorry, that's Scottish Gaelic. Um, the word for the sun is the old feminine word grian, and the word for the moon is the feminine word galak. Anyway, they're both feminine words. Interesting. So that in the land of the goddess, both of them are feminine words. But my point here is not that it should be reversed, but we need to get beyond the gender nomenclations of grammar. Now, if a, so the first person who ever said there was a, 
that you could use gender in combination with sex was in 1955, but it did not become popularly used until the 70s and 80s by some of the early feminists who wanted to distinguish that, that there were different roles rather than the ones that had been assigned by the culture for whatever sex you were. And gender, um, in, in my complete understanding of this over the years, um, is determined by a culture. And, and, and actually, if you go through the history of humanity, um, there would be times when someone born female was the active force in matrilineal cultures, you know, so it wasn't our normal, oh, the, the feminine is just receptive and passive or, you know, so, so, uh, some, some of the um, just mothers and wives and that kind of thing, or just caregivers and nurturers. There were other roles that someone born female, that is to say an XX human, could have something very different than what our more recent culture is assigned to it. Um, so gender, uh, it would, would then over the years take on a whole different connotation, so much so that in the uh, pattern app, which um, many of you are familiar with, it was uh, the brilliant design of um, Lisa Donovan who created this amazing um, uh, application of the shamanic uh, astrology paradigm. In her generation, gender had replaced sex as a word to use. So, so, so basically the language of that generation is opposite gender, you know, rather than opposite sex, interestingly. Now, as this whole thing has expanded and we, we're now confused and it's ambiguous, what are we talking about, sex or gender? And, it, and it's this foundational way of looking at it. I'm saying, well, we are XX or XY unless you happen to be one of those really rare cases where you're both. Now, I, uh, maybe I won't interject it here, but please remind me, Mary, later to talk about my first op opportunity I had to do a chart for someone who was bi uh, biologically both. And that, had, that was based on chromosomal um, uh, um, laboratory research that she, she actually, I shouldn't say she, because she actually identifies with a masculine gender at this point, but we'll look at that later on. Um, so maybe this would be the time to put up the, that whole string of letters. This is usually um, shortened rather than to see the whole string of them to LGBTQ. So, so uh, Q then becomes the, 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 the letter for all the other possibilities and they keep adding letters. Um, and the definitions, I will not go into every one of them here at this point. Um, in fact, we were discussing, you know, before we started this broadcast that um, we can even add another one. There's now like um, teenagers uh, uh, asking their parents if they can identify as AI, as a robot, you know, which is a little bit different than, than um, having sex with robots, which is what um, actually you'd be amazed how many people in uh, Japan are now doing that. Um, uh, they, there's a, a hugely uh, um, uh, profitable cottage industry in Korea and Japan and China um, because there's less women and the men are only virtual and then so they get a sex robot, you know, so uh, fascinating developments here. So there's all, these are all different genders, but if you look at the, uh, the way this has uh, been looked at historically, um, many cultures, uh, Native American, um, Aboriginal, um, different parts of the world have um, seen beyond the very specific cultural roles that are put on someone born a man or born a woman. Um, there's a, a, an example that I, that I had been talking about um, um, with Mary and Ashling before we got on this call, um, that uh, in some Asian countries, like here in the Philippines, a Catholic country, or in, the, in Thailand, a Buddhist country, um, there are plenty of biological males who do not identify with the, the assigned cultural role for biological males who are 
different words for it. Um, I remember in Thailand, it's called a katoi, I believe. Um, um, I forget the name of it here, but it's um, basically they're lady boys, you know, so they basically uh, dress as women and they, they're, they're actually behaving as, as, as women. But as far as I know, there's no sex change operation that takes place. So there is, it, it, to me, these are all the completely understandable approach a person would take if they do not feel comfortable with what the culture they're born into says a man is supposed to be or a woman is supposed to be. Um, so anyway, circling back, if our starting point is first we're human, and I do believe strongly, and those that have followed the shamanic astrology work for a long time, including the renaissance of the sacred feminine, the renaissance of the sacred workshops that I've done in the past. It, and then some of the, you can see the videos on this um, and the further adventures of shamanic astrology on our website. I have a strong belief that prior to five or 6,000 years ago, for 300,000 years, human beings were cooperative men and women were not um, uh, adversaries. Um, so it was a cooperative um, uh, and collaborative um, culture that we, that we actually come from. Um, it's only recently um, that uh, it's, it's like split off. And so uh, of course the reaction against that is to say, wait a minute, I don't want to identify with what the patriarchal culture says a man is supposed to be, or what the, uh, you know, the, the matriarchal culture, uh, the, sorry, the patriarchal culture would say a woman should be and so on. So we've expanded that. And in the early years of shamanic astrology, that was really, I think, one of the greatest liberating things. I'm Ashling, I think you were saying something about that earlier, the, the experience you had of um, some sessions you've done where it really freed the person. Do you want to, to mention about that? Sure. Yeah, um, I had the privilege of, of offering some sessions to particularly two males who had um, who had a really strong um, feminine kind of archetype within within their chart in their Venus and Mars and it just had such a profound impact um, when they went away from the session because it was like giving themselves permission to um, to express themselves differently yeah. which they found challenging yeah. yeah. And since I'm pausing for a moment, since I've kind of presented a, a, a lot there in a, in a long string, um, I'm wondering if um, you wanted to clarify anything or ask anything, Mary. I think, um, no, I think which, um, that this is still major intro and I, I'm knowing that you're gonna be speaking about the charts and how the archetypes as they express can be tied into all of this. I mean, mm -hmm. having the history for where this has come from, where it's going, and then how we actually use it in shamanic astrology, right. right, is gonna be the real gift of this whole exercise, I think. So um, I, I, this might be a good point for me to bring up the experience that I just had a few weeks ago, very synchronistic with our conversation today. For the very first time, I had the opportunity to do a session for someone who was um, uh, born with full XXXY. Um, and so therefore both um, sexual organs. Um, now this is very different. I mean, I can also say that in my past history as being an astrologer, oh my gosh, I've had the opportunity to do hundreds of horoscopes for um, uh, gay women, lesbian, uh, gay, lesbian women, gay men, um, basically uh, also uh, individuals that um, are interested in both sexes um, and so on. So I have plenty of, of experience with looking at those charts, but it was the first time I saw a, a, the chart in session with um, uh, someone who was clearly hermaphrodite at birth. And <laughs> It was very mind blowing because as we're gonna see, as we go through the different 24 genders within our system, and I, I brought this up as a question to, to Mary and Ashling ahead of time. What do, you what do you think this chart was for someone who was pure 
uh, hermaphrodite. I mean, and it turned out this person, Jupiter, Venus, and Mars in Gemini, which um, often is seen as the least uh, polarized, the most ambiguous uh, when it comes to uh, binary, I guess you could say. And meanwhile, also at Sun and Leo and Sag Moon, um, she identified, not she, um, this person identifies in a masculine gender at this point. And, and it would make sense with um, Sag Moon and Sun and Leo. Um, but I just, uh, God, that's amazing. The first time I ever had a chance to look at one of these charts, and it was all, it was this Gemini, Venus, and Mars. Both the expression, both the both Mars and Venus, both in the sign that is that is most ambiguous. Which, uh, wow, it just it, to me, it kind of confirmed certain insights that you know along the way here. Um, so, getting back to to basics to go through this. Um, any system, any system, and this, I guess, this string of letters here is the way that the, the more um, woke culture would look at it at this point. You know, all these different options, all these different options that are different from the uh, cultural view of what a man or a woman is supposed to be. Uh, which I believe come from this um, over-identification with certain roles based upon your biology. There's an organization in England that believes there's as many as 100 genders. And just as in many, many systems of astrology, they will cut the pie of life in different segments. All right, you know, so you, you, you can have a lot of different forms of sacred geometry. In the shamanic astrology system, um, we have that 12 times 12, the 144 storylines, but also 12 gods and 12 goddesses, 12 archetypes of the masculine, 12 archetypes of the feminine. So there's 24. Now, in our paradigm, as most of you know that have followed this, we don't place a lot of focus as much as many other forms of astrology on the sun sign. Now this comes from much of the 1970s innovations where the re realization was the sun sign was sort of like a relic of patriarchy, one God above, above others. And then it also was something that could very conveniently put people into 12 boxes as if um, everybody born in the month of Aries is going to be a certain way. Well, it was pretty, uh, and, and so on. It didn't take very long to see that that was really not true. And it's one of the reasons why um, so many people um, uh, who are quite, you know, has some degree of you know, intellectual sophistication and intelligence would look askance at something that put people into those general boxes. Well, what over a period of time, what I discovered and what we discovered was that the Mars position on a biological male chart and the Venus position on a biological female chart was the best representation of what expression of, which we can now say of gender that that person came into the life to investigate. It's, it's like a set of instructions. Be that one, learn what that one is. Um, much of uh, this approach also includes education because if you've only been told, like say in, in uh, sort of basic Catholicism that, that there were only a couple of choices, you can be successful as a mother or wife, or you can be in the convent. <laughs> and, and possibly if you were heretical, you could identify with Mary Magdalene and that would get you in trouble. Um, or up until the 14th or 15th century, you could uh, uh, be a courtesan, but then they became the lady in red and were considered prostitutes, you know? So it's so basically there are only a few roles that were available, but since the early seventies, 
um, this is expanded beautifully for those who are biologically feminine, female, I mean. So, so therefore, that, that expanded. The women's, the women's movement uh, just contributed hugely to that. Um, uh, it hasn't been quite as easy for men. Um, but I, and I, I've actually made the statement in the past that I believe that hierarchical patriarchy and the assignment of male role, gender roles to by being biologically, when you're biologically male, um, has been even harder on men than on women. And, and so it's really harder for men to find what it is to actually be their gender when they are biologically male. I believe strongly that one of the greatest contributions of the shamanic astrology paradigm is this template that shows 24 gender options. Now it can actually be the case that the, and I, I need to make this pretty clear, that this is organic and evolving. So for example, one of the differences between the archetypal understanding within shamanic astrology is actually different than Jung's view. Jung's view was in a sense that the archetypes were eternal and kind of the same everywhere forever. The, the post-Jungians, including some of the archetypal psychologists that I most love, say that actually archetypes evolve, they change based upon, you know, what, um, uh, you know, what age we're in, you know, where we are in the processional cycle, but also based on what culture we're in. Um, and, and so therefore there can be different expressions that evolve and change over time that operate out of the archetypal categories. So they're not like eternally static, but they're changing. So therefore what is pre pre being presented next here um, is not some dogma. And I'm, I'm quite certain that if, the, if this card deck um, was um, developed 10 years from now, uh, there'd be maybe different images, there would be um, uh, a different way of understanding how um, uh, say a man with Mars and Scorpio, um, someone born male, you know, X, 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 an XY being um, uh, born that type of human and what Mars and Scorpio would look like now compared to how it would look like 10 years from now. I mean, that can change. Um, the same thing for all of them. Um, and, and this is uh, and it's certainly one of the areas of um, deep exploration. And it's also why um, uh, in some of the other vlogcasts, uh, ones that I've had the opportunity to do with Mary, um, we've done this um, deeper dive into the mystery schools, into the archetypes themselves, to see what they were in the past, what you know, what they are now, and, and, the, and how they, what they can evolve into. You know, the, the shift of, of how we understand them as we go into a different age. All right. Um, this is just a, a, in a sense, a tentative approach to be able to see how we can work with this. Again, as a foundational piece, if you're born biologically male, then the Mars position would, would be considered to be the version of the masculine that you came in, the, 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 the gender version of the masculine you came in to investigate. And the Venus position uh, if you're born biologically female, um, would be what gender expression of that you came in to investigate. And, and uh, th that's in a sense, that's what's available now. It, th this, would be, this would be a very different looking card deck 2000 years ago. Um, uh, it might be a very different one even 10 years from now. Uh, I might even want to modify a few of these cards even you know, this year. But, but, but still the, the way in which the shamanic astrologer talks about the Venus position or the Mars position um, uh, is amazingly liberating and helpful to someone receiving the session. It's way beyond the sun sign, way beyond um, uh, cultural views of what it is to be a man or a woman. 
which is why there's been such a rebellion against that and why that whole string of letters um, you know, shows up as the variety of different options. My problem with that though, is that it splits people apart. It, it's part of, a, of, a, of, of identity politics, which at this part, at this point in our evolution, I don't know whether it's that useful any longer. Um, I, I'd, I'd like to go back to, to we're all human, you know, and we can collaborate and, and, and we all can connect heartfully regardless of, um, you know, what, what our gender identification is, you see. Um, so Daniel, you, yes, yes, Mary. So is it, I mean, everything is cyclical. I mean, we know that from everything that we study in shamanic astrology. So could, could you consider this as a point that the individuation of this gender expression is going to its max and that that cycle cycles back by um, going completely into oneness, completely into unisex, whether that's done um, through chemistry or if that's done through evolutionary process, um, we're already seeing that there are- Well, that, 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 that does appear to be part of the agenda um, <clears throat> to, but, but there's two different ways we can look at this. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, at the end of an age, you know, the end and the beginning of the great 26,000 year cycle, all of the different possibilities become available again. You know, so, so therefore um, a person with a Scorpio moon, for example, can access that version of the female gender, uh, that version, that gender expression of the female sex that was available at that point, which was a very different thing that's been allowed recently. Um, we can go back to um, pre-patriarchal versions of men, all right, Ma uh, biological males, where um, the, the hunter was not the patriarchal version of the hunter. It was the hunter who actually went out and danced with the animal, became the animal, um, uh, merged with the animal. And then an agreement was made between the human and the animal where the animal will say, yes, I will, get, I'll, you can kill me and I'll be the food for your family. But it was, a, it was a very magical dance that that individual would do. That was the older version of Gemini for, 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 the, for masculine, uh, for, for men. Uh, another example of it would be um, the, for men, biological males, prior to patriarchy, there was the dogda, the, the version of the masculine that to gain his sovereignty married the land. It was a, known as the uh, the bull god, right? And and that's a very very different expression than what patriarchy did, which is to turn masculine totally into you know consciousness or you know or or uh, rulership or something like that, right? So um, the, 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 we can access throughout all time periods in history these different possibilities. We can even access what uh, the Aborigines did or what the Lakota did, um, uh, the, the, the great variety of different um, and Aboriginal cultures that honored the individuals who, who were somewhere in, the, in between, you mm -hmm. know, who were not um, uh, completely comfortable with the uh, full on what a man is supposed to be or what a woman is supposed to be. And they were honored. They were the Hayoka. They were the, you know, they were the um, other words. Every culture had, you know, a word for that. Um, so we can access that information to have an understanding of where we can go next. But, uh, but I, I, I'm not so comfortable with the idea of going, of, of denying our uh, binary nature, the yin yang, the, 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 the universe um, uh, is built on, on that force. We are on a planet that, is, that has duality and polarity. Um, so bringing in all the different uh, individual pieces into a wholeness, but not some kind of um, uh, sexless, um, uh, energy-less uh, unity, which um, is essentially then what the, the, pur the purpose of um, you know, getting rid of sex, getting rid of and putting everybody into a machine, you know, having it be a, 
um, uh, non-organic and that kind of thing, which is the danger. And I, I've spoken about that before with um, the uh, talks I've given about the shadow of Aquarius, you know, which is to turn turn everybody into a drone in, in the Borg, you know. So um, I'm into, uh, and most of most of my teachers, you know, most of my metaphys metaphysical teachers, uh, not and they're not even astrologers, support the fact that our original nature is quote binary, and that's the masculine and the feminine force archetypally does exist, and and uh, but the problem is then when a culture assigns certain gender roles to that, and that's what changes, you know, throughout history. Um, now, uh, actually, uh, since you've broached this subject, you brought this up. Um, late breaking news from RFK Jr., uh, children's defense, health defense, male infertility, threatening future of the human race. <laughs> the variety of factors that have caused the male fertility to go down 56%. Um, uh, since uh, since just 20 years ago. Uh, there's many reasons for that, including the hormonal stuff, um, probably the, the um, non-native EMFs, you know, things like that. Um, but there is an attempt, in my opinion, to um, uh, uh, move humanity in the direction that I'm looking at as the shadow of what you said. I might have misunderstood what you were presenting there, but I, but I've always looked at the diversity in wholeness, you know, not the uh, homogenization and of um, some kind of um, vanilla version of androgyny, you know, so that within the spectrum of possibilities, then it's within the wholeness. It's like the um, diversity in, in unity. Right. But but with the amount of diversity that there is, and some of that indicating that it might not be a reproducing uh, individuation, I, I mean, I have to consider the fact that there was a great benefit to having um, a belief system that was more binary when the earth needed populating. I don't think we're in a place where we want to continue to populate the earth. So I'm just wondering if some of this natural evolution into so many diverse expressions of this binary system isn't something that helps slow down what um, has in the past been part of a replication of our species. Well, um, so Mary, um, there is an attempt by the power, in my opinion, the powers that shouldn't be mm -hmm. to reduce the human population. Definitely, yes. But, okay, but, and actually having been a follower of people like uh, Buckminster Fuller and other individuals like that, it's a complete social Darwinist hoax that somehow there's too many people on the planet. Now, to have an opportunity to do something other than being a father or a mother, I think is fantastic. Right. But I mean, so that's many, many different options, you know, so I'm not saying everybody is here on the planet to be a to, to here to to re, reproduce, but creativity and and vibrancy comes from all of the archetypes that operates out of uh, out out of binary. So yin yang is binary. Binary. We're not talking here now about the cultural roles of masculine and feminine, but the nature of the universe itself is mm -hmm. is is that here in this zone and i can give you some you know background documentation on that from some major spiritual teachers um uh so it the idea is not to turn everybody into a reproducer um but uh, in fact for a long period of time i mean this the, 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 i have whole like uh, videos on this um which is that the the uh, invention of quote big agriculture you know the modification of plants so that you actually have the subjugation of, uh, of, of, of plant life so then you needed a greater population in order to uh, work the fields there are many thinkers today to consider that to be uh, one of the worst things that ever happened to humanity because for 300,000 years the population was stable hunter-gatherer approach was really stable but that didn't mean people were um, not binary or they were not, they just had different <coughs> gender um, roles 
within the nature of that culture. Like the bonobos have different gender roles, but they're binary. You know, uh, the chimpanzees do it in a different way. And human beings throughout history have done it in a variety of different ways. So here at the beginning and the end, and the end and the beginning of the whole uh, cycle, we have all the possibilities available again. My problem with this long string is that it separates people. It would be kind of like saying, um, well, I'm a Scorpio Mars and I need special rights because I'm a Mars and Scorpio. You know? <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's like we're all human um, and, and, uh, all, and all of us can work together and value all the different places on the wheel without it becoming some sort of homogenized um, 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 androgyny. You know, so I don't think, uh, uh, I, I think that it's valuable to have the dynamism of creation, which it comes from um, the different forces that, uh, that um, are continually going into creation and out of creation. It even shows up like that in the Hindu, you know, uh, the Shiva, you know, the, 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 the you know, right. creation, destruction and, and, and maintenance, you know, so those forces are all inherent in that also. So, um, that thank you for give, make, giving me an opportunity to expand on that more. Uh, the, the other thing about this is that um, we know for sure there's some kind of agenda happening because uh, Amazon is now banning books. Amazon quietly removes a book criticizing transgender ideology. Not that transgender shouldn't be a choice, but an attempt to say how they're actually advocating somebody who's a teenager to get a sex change operation, you know? Um, and and uh, which, um, uh, what did you share with me, Ashley? It's quite, quite astounding. Yeah, it just, um, my health insurance policy uh, covers, uh, yeah, operations to, to change my gender, but doesn't sex. cover parenting. Change for sex, yeah. The, yeah. the physical equipment, yes. Physical, yeah, but it won't cover therapy or counseling, mm -hmm. which is interesting. Which is a, a stunning expression of what I'm talking about. And what was being suppressed was a book talking about all the people who, in a sense, were manipulated into getting the operation who regretted it afterwards, right? So, which is not really being talked about that much. I still think think it should be a choice, of course, you know, but, but to, to present it in such a way that, that um, in a sense, are manipulated into it, uh, it is, uh, I think, the problem. All right. Back to, though, what can be offered through our paradigm. Mm -hmm. So part of it is education. Part of it is ex ex going beyond what any given culture, you know, says about um, uh, how you should be if you're born biologically male or biologically female. Um, uh, as I was mentioning before, um, I think it's in more recent times been harder on biological males than biological females. Um, some of the um, uh, thinkers that I uh, respect and have been influenced by have actually made the statement that it's actually easier for a biological woman to behave in male roles than it is for biological men to behave in female roles or you know, the, the, the culturally version, version of female roles. Um, so, it's, so that's a, just another example of where it's out of balance. I mean, it even shows up with um, the situation on the planet today. You know, uh, many, many people are writing articles like, where are the men? They're wimps. Why aren't they protecting people? Why aren't they protecting their children, you know, from, from, from what they have to go through to be masked up and separated and not being able to touch and hug and so on, you know? Um, I mean, it's a, there's sort of a, an emasculation that has happened, you know? So the protector role that is one of the major ones in, um, archetypally for both men and women has essentially been driven out of men, biological men. Um, we could take a look at that if we wanted to see some of the ways that we see it today with the 24 genders. Um, did you uh, did you put um, Aries up there? Oh, 
No. Okay. Well, let's let's um. Uh, let's let's we, maybe we can. We are God. We're starting with Aquarius. All right. Uh, I know that's a picture of me a little bit younger. Um, uh, it was not my choice. Um, uh, the guy that did the cards. Uh, I'll have to tell a little story here. Uh, the guy that did the cards, the brilliant artist Roy Purcell, who did the artwork on these, he had heard me probably too many times um, uh, making jokes about Aquarius and, you know, as if uh, people have accused me of being too hard on Aquarius. And so he decides to put my face on the Aquarian card, right? Um, <laughs> uh, I did it's somewhat embarrassing, but you had to put it up there for, for me. But anyway, um, so there is a similarity. You can go back to Aquarius, so we can describe this. There is an actual similarity at this point, because the intent here, I mean, the sign Aquarius is archetypally masculine. It is a sign of, involu of, of evolution rather than involution. And, and so therefore it is in the category of archetypal masculine, air and fire are that. And the female version of Aquarius is definitely about consciousness and expansion. The, the Aquarian, uh, if we, we think of the, if someone born female who's the Aquarian um, Venus position is, is not, uh, comfortable, we could say, with many of the uh, culturally attributed versions of, uh, of, of, of what a woman is supposed to be. Uh, th these are um, uh, brilliant uh, uh, consciousness, expanded free beings. Um, uh, I I've often uh, noted that uh, the female version of this is, uh, can, can be on a shadow side, light polarized. They're two out of their bodies. But boy, in a positive sense, they soar with the eagles, you know? I mean, they, they um, have that spacious cosmic overview. And, and it's, I guess you could say, more related to the Sophic or the Saraswati version of the feminine. Not mother nurturer and certainly not wife partner. <laughs> you know? So it's the, the consciousness aspect of, um, the, of the of biological female and through this gender the Aquarian gender, if you're born female. <clears throat> now, for the masculine, for somebody born biologically male, they can be that way too, but, but very often um, it's another form of objectivity. You know, it's kind of a, a, the, the visionary, but also the scientist, you know, the one who, who objectively investigates also all sides of something. <clears throat> but then that would also be the shadow side of science. <clears throat> open to the highest bidder, uh, riddled with subjectivity when it's intended to be the high flying cosmic overview. So the, so there would be based on the way the culture is currently, uh, the male gender, sorry, I get confused about it too, the male sex version of Aquarius can be agnostic, but also humanist you know, so they they have an idealism about the human condition, but they don't have that sort of touchy feely uh, version of mis mystical version of um, of divinity the way that uh, 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 the, the, the uh, someone biologically female would relate to it. So those are some of the unique differences between those two. Now that could change in ten years, but um, but as, yes, Mary. Um, and you would say, from what I've heard you speak before, that the um, both of them would, would be considered transpersonal and free electrons in the way yes. that mm -hmm. they would approach their partnerships. Right. Uh, or not, not me. Like, I'll, I'll, I'll give you that very quick example. I think some of you heard me say before that uh, my first wife was Venus, Mars, and Moon in Aquarius. Okay. And I would give these relationship workshops and I would be talking about what Libra likes, Libra sun, Libra rising, um, which is pair bonding, you know, a, a, a commitment through a partnership. And I would use the expression pair bonding and, and this Aquarian woman 
in the back of the room would be jumping up and down and saying, I hate it when you say that, it sounds like bondage to me, <laughs> which, uh, which uh, can be the way Aquarius could actually think of that word. Um, but from the perspective of Libra or Aries, mm -hmm. commitment is for as much freedom as the freedom of the, of the Aquarius type. I mean, there are different forms of freedom. For those that are in a very clear commitment, whether it's in a relationship or whether it's a mission and purpose statement or as a protector, male or female version of Aries, for example, is every bit as free. I mean, that's a whole other form of uh, freedom, freedom through commitment rather than, say, freedom through being a free electron. That makes sense? Yes. Well, let's try another one out just as, a, as an example of our approach here. Um, I was referring to this one earlier and, and actually the masculine version, the, the, when I, the, uh, the, the um, biological male version and the biological uh, female version of Gemini is also in the category of archetypally masculine. And so therefore it's an air sign. And in my experience of you know, 50 years of doing charts is that it's the one that is least um, you know, on the surface, um, least um, polarized between the cultural views of masculine and feminine. So therefore we have like uh, in the Gemini archetype, the Hayoka, the uh, the in-between being, the, the being who can shapeshift, the one who can be actually anything they want to be, in which I thought it was extremely fitting that, uh, and you can see the coyote there on both of them, <laughs> um, which represents that Hayoka uh, shapeshifting um, um, uh, trickster element of it, that I thought it was so fitting that the one time I had a chance to, to actually do a chart of somebody who was clearly hermaphrodite to begin with, is that <laughs> Venus and Mars were both Gemini, you know, which was very intriguing. Um, you know, so there's a similarity here, although um, based upon the cultural's, the culture's, um, you know, what it allows people to do um, there can be a, a difference between what the, the masculine, the, the, the biologically male version of Gemini can do with the archetype compared to the, to the female, but, it, but they're very similar. And again, Danielle, in your book, you talk about Gemini being impersonal, free electron, and then you say they can also participate in what you termed the sacred relationship version. Um, why don't you say something about that in regards to Gemini? Um, well, this this is one that has uh, quite a, um, a long history. Um, uh, so you would have basically the the Native American version of Cocapelle, or the European version of Don Juan, who's never father, never. Um, seen as a, a you know husband or a boyfriend but certainly loves sex <laughs> and and will show up and, and have a marvelous magical dancing connection but what but you're referring to here is that if a person is loaded with gemini what would be the nature of, a, of the relationship if they um did decide to bond with someone because you just cannot you can't just only look at the venus or mars position it was the whole rest of the chart so a, a, the gemini sag kind of uh relationship commitment um is is a uh, is free is uh is a, a trail mate is a, a a quest mate should they choose to do that and what i think also what you're referring to also would apply to, to virgo and that sometimes if we can think of Coca Pelle showing up or Don Juan showing up when it's not perceived of as a, um, the arrival of a boyfriend or a father or a husband is that it's a magical encounter happening in sacred space. Um, same thing with Virgo. Virgo can create a space for sacred connection, which is not then seen through the, um, 
perception of the more ordinary sense of what a marriage is or you know what a um, um, uh, you get together with someone to have a family or you, you get together with someone in order to have to be a couple it's a, it's just a different expression it doesn't mean it's not um, authentic or or um, valid or, or and as you say sacred yes it can be a tremendously sacred connection it obviously has its shadow also hmm. And Pisces does that as well, right? Yeah, it can. And should they should they choose to be personal? Yes. I I could see it. I mean, I can see where how sacred puts it into a little different category. Mm -hmm. mm. So Dan, uh, should, we, should we try? Should we try one more? Mm -hmm. What I'd like to summarize that I've heard you say mm -hmm. is: you look at the chart, you're and the way they're imprinted with their biological sex is where you begin. And the archetypes that are represented there, whether they are the elements of air and fire mm -hmm. is what determines and cues you to them being masculine archetypes. And if Arch they, Archetypally, yes. yes. Uh -huh. And if they are the archetype or if the elements that you find there are water and earth then that's cueing you that these archetypes are more feminine and so by looking at that combination of the elements that the archetypes yes, yes. are part of that is how you're able on the chart to give yes. guidance to the person yeah yeah and, and actually what you're now saying here actually an insight just came through here back to what you presented earlier um is that one of the ways to perceive what I'm meaning by binary is involution, involution and evolution. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. So that, that is perceived also in however we want to design a yin-yang symbol also. Mm -hmm. See, so, so there's the sort of the, the involution path, earth and water, archetypally feminine. The evolutionary path, archetypally masculine mm -hmm. and it's not to be identified with being a man okay um is uh is is the is fire is fire and air and so it's just another way of perceiving how the duality operates how the the binary operates how the involution evolution dynamic operates um so you you've actually uh given me a, a whole other way of, of explaining it thank you well that well so there's two things really that you look at on the chart what elements those the venus and mars are in but you also have to look at the script to see if their life story is about going up and out uh, right. or down and in and so then right. you're you're going to look at your ascendant and even your um mm -hmm. your jupiter right uh, archetypes to see so you obviously have to look at the whole chart uh, but but actually just to, to to make one additional note it does not start with whether you're xx or xy it starts with your human yeah of course <laughs> that's really the starting point right we seem um, to be getting more information that there's people on this planet that maybe are from outside of this system and maybe aren't so that that'll bring in an even more interesting element down the road well but even even more to the uh, <laughs> sorry to sorry to go down that rabbit hole but it's also like you begin to notice that there's some of the people we run into that are already in the mainframe you know i mean they're all they're they, they're like in a sense already like clones or something you know so they probably are not human right so there that's that whole other deal but uh, I, I i'd like to stick with i you know what i i'm really fortunate and most of us that do shamanic astrology are quite fortunate because we really don't get a genuine cross-section of all the people out there you know the the, the people that um get sessions from us are um and uh, you know they're all they're they're questing. You know they're they're uh, they're open hearted. Um, uh, they've already at least a little bit separated from um, you know cultural relativity. You know they they they're beyond. Uh, they're they're wanting to think outside of the box in some way to know more about their story. Um, I, I so I, it took this long to I finally met someone who was 
tested out as being both, you know, first true hermaphrodite, right? Uh, and this is, I'm saying this is different than somebody who's gone through a sex same change uh, uh, operation. And that's a whole other different thing. Um, and, and I don't think, at least not that I know of, I don't think I've done a session at this point for somebody who's AI. You never know. Um, but by the way, Mary, um, I, it just occurred to me, you know, how many more minutes do you have on the, um, on the uh, recording? We've been talking for about an hour, Daniel. We're but you, oh, oh, I see. But I thought you might have started the two hour slot for, um, uh, for the Zoom call. It started at three. The slot went from 3.30 to 5.30. So we are three minutes away from that. I went in to try to amend it. And when it is actually uh, recording, it doesn't appear that I can. So uh, I think we can continue past 5.30. I've never experienced mm -hmm. even on our other calls that we were abruptly cut off. Cut okay, off. I, was, I wasn't certain about that, okay. Uh, yeah. um, well, we don't need to go too much further. We've covered a, a, a great deal of um, ground here. Um, so again, it's, this is an organic evolving body of knowledge, but I, I guess we, in our last minutes, we can look at a couple more of these. Um, and the, the Virgo one is an involution one. Mm -hmm. um, and what that translates out for biological males, we I sometimes call it the priest archetype, dedicated in service to spirit. Servant of the goddess, actually. Loving Gaia more than anything. And, and then the, the female version of Virgo, which um, I spent pretty much my entire astrological career uh, trying to revision from the horrendous uh, judgments against it that uh, often the mainstream gives toward it, um, is, the, uh, is the, earth, the earth mother herself, you know, the, the spider woman, the web weaver, um, the, the, the triple fates, the, the, the um, uh, and so this is not meant to be the other version of spider. This is grandmother spider, not what is sometimes in some patriarchal cultures will say spider is the, is the most, uh, um, you know, the femme fatale, most negative example of the, of, of the dark feminine. No, that's not what is being represented here. This is, this is, um, the creatrix of uh, our, our uh, beloved planet Earth, and not just the Earth, but also the starry patterns. You know, um, the uh, so I, I, this there's a similarity in these two. The problem is, it's also judged against. So so I mean, because there, there's a, in service to spirit means your focus is not on specifically. Um, your personal relationships, and it's not specifically on um, uh, issues of self-interest. You know, so it's it, it's something which um, is dedicated to um, the web of life, and 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 uh, and in harmony with it. You know, it's being part of that. Um, uh, uh, it's more animistic, I guess you could say. You know, it, there's there's nothing about it that is separate from our organic nature and our connection to Mother Earth. And they used to be considered renunciate, but again, in combination with other archetypes on the chart, that's not necessarily true. And, mm -hmm. and they're impersonal, but but it's but still um, the relationship is with Gaia and Gaia's web. So mm -hmm. that, that makes it sacred right there. Right. Right. In, in a, in, if we were having a, a, an investigation in just into partnership and relationship, and then we could describe some of the very fascinating ways that the creation of sacred space and the way of honoring the sacred feminine can happen in, in, in both in a personal relationship. Um, uh, but that's a, a story for a different day. Let's try one more. So the here we have an evolutionary one, one that is archetypally masculine. And it was actually the Leo archetype itself that was the thing that convinced me that the rising sign is not how we are, but what we're moving toward. Well, the same thing can be true if a man has Mars in Leo, or if a woman has Venus in Leo, 
it may not initially be that easy to do. But in our system, the definition of this expression of gender is being a creator, making it up any way you want, being an inspiring person who frees others to be everything they can be. And it's fascinating that the artist here used the image of this uh, uh, boy together with the, with the animal and with the, you know, the lion and, and also with an older uh, person. Um, and it, it's capturing that sense of um, sovereignty, but you might not think of that when you think of the boy, but one of our elements of the Leo archetype is like a healthy two-year-old, you know, where a person is, is, um, has a beginner's mind, but a confidence and an assurity that they can essentially make it up any way they want. Um, and that, and, and the female version of this, uh, of course, is um, uh, what we call Amazon queen, you know, leading woman, you know, someone who through her presence and through her charisma and through her vision inspires others to be everything they can be. It's beautiful gender expressions depend of, 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 the, of the different uh, sexes. Um, as we wrap up our discussion today, um, Ashling, any thoughts coming up for you that uh, we might want to further consider? Yeah, well, actually, Daniel, it would be it would be great if you could speak a little bit more into um, the inner sacred marriage piece, where mm, mm, yeah. Mm -hmm. And right, know. right. So thank you. Um, actually, um, that, slip, that that went through my consciousness about 20 minutes ago. And, <laughs> and, and, and so thanks for bringing it back. Um, yeah, so this the exact same gender possibilities are inherent through the opposite sex planet. You see, so if a woman's Mars position is one of the 12, right? You know, uh, if, a, if a man's Venus position is one of the 12, that starts out as the projected image. Now, this would not have been something available to, in, a, in, in many ancient cultures where you're 14 or 15, you, you're a man. And it's only what the culture says a man is, right? Or um, the, even up in the mountains here in the Philippines, there's still, you know, the girls get pregnant at 14 or 15, you know, and then they get married. You know, there's, there's not an opportunity to work out the projections. But then after having an opportunity to experience the other, you know, in a, in a dynamic way, you know, by testing it out, you know, the whole adolescence, teenager years, and, and gosh, I mean, depending on different time periods in history, even now, it's like well, adulthood in, in, in America is practically pushed back to 29 or 30. <laughs> and much of that due to the um, economic situation is uh, very different than when I was growing up, where well, I'm 18, and my parents' attitude was, get them out of here. We don't want them sticking around to take care of us, you know, so like, <laughs> individuation happened at 18, you know, so um, uh, it's not set in stone about that, but our view in this system today is that we work out the projection, work with that external image, and then it's integrated. So therefore a woman's Mars also then is part of her overall nature. You know, it's, it's your inner wholeness of your, of your, of your uh, archetypal masculine and feminine side. And, and so it's also a union of these expressions of gender, you know, and, and that's really what's most important. So, and, and, and to me, this is um, the radical innovation that, that shamanic astrology makes beyond Jung's view. Because Jung's idea was every man has an animus that looks, a, an anima, sorry, that looks a certain way. And that was based upon the cultural understanding at that time of what a man was and what he needed from a woman. And the same thing would happen with the projection 
that of a woman's animus. Now, if you only went by his definitions, that would say that every man meets his soul through a woman. Every woman meets her spirit through a man, as if somehow she needs her, to find her consciousness through the masculine. And, you know, the man needs to find his soul, you know, his, his, his emotions or feelings through a woman. I'm sorry, it's not that simple. <laughs> so, so, and this is a, a very deep part of the, uh, the, the counseling that happens in, in shamanic astrology is to get to know who that projected image is. If a guy has, um, you know, Venus and Aquarius, that's not a mother. <laughs> um, it's not a nurturer, but, but, that's, but that's something for him to be integrated within himself as his own inner muse, you see. So the, the knowledge of these different gender expressions is super important in, in doing the, the sacred marriage work of the integration of that other part of ourself that we go through a process of first learning about through projecting it externally. Yes, that and is so. In, so in the oh, oh, so thanks for bringing it up again because in the book, in the section that shows the twenty-four gods and goddesses, there is also some lines in there about uh, what it is if it's the projected image, right? So it's like both both uh, just both expressions that are that are described there. Um, uh, that 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 book was a preliminary um, inquiry into the subject that we've now taken a little bit further. Um, so um, thanks for uh, doing that together with me. Um, and this is certainly going to be something that opens the door for lots more inquiry, lots more investigation. Uh, Mary, did you have any additional thing you wanted to say? I just wanted to say that not only understanding that um, and becoming aware of what your opposite sex planet is. Um, it allowed me to be free to express my Scorpio, which I don't think I would have done if I hadn't um, mm -hmm. become familiar mm -hmm. with that from shamanic astrology. But as soon as I did achieve some degree of wholeness by doing that, mm -hmm. my partner showed up immediately. So that was the other piece of it that I think is uh, it's not a guarantee, but it definitely is a, a bigger possibility. Oh my God, yes, well said. That's a, a great example. And, and I could say from my own side, when I stopped projecting Venus and Virgo onto an individual woman and realized that who my lover really was, which was Gaia herself, when I took the absolute final step through that doorway and surrendered to trying to get the, the Virgo women to love me, um, amazingly enough, an amazing woman showed up, you know, so I can tell a really similar story on that, Mary, as you know. Mm -hmm. Good way to end it, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's a happy ending to this shamanic astrology mm -hmm. story. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, probably next time we do the vlog cast, um, it'll be to, to go further into two more of the other, two more signs. I think we'll look at that next time. So thanks for your help on this, Ashling, and I look forward to doing more of this together with you also. Okay, thank you so much. Great. You get some sleep now. <laughs> right. <laughs> I will. What time is it in Ireland? It's um, 1.40 oh a.m. Uh, thank you for everything you did. Thank you for your commitment no to helping us on this, right. yeah. Right. Talk to, talk to you later. Right. Bye. Bye. Yes. Bye, everyone.